What is really going on, Crypto Savages? You are listening to the Coin Spice Podcast with host C. Edward Kelso, editor in chief at CoinSpice.io, your home for spicy crypto things on the net. What is really going on, Crypto Savages? This is your host, C. Edward Kelso, editor in chief out of CoinSpice.io, back with another episode of the Coin Spice Podcast. This time around, I've got Gene Epstein. He is former columnist for Barron's. Now he's turned his attention to reinvigorating, bringing back Oxford-style debates through what's known as the Soho Forum. It's a wonderful uh, venue. It's really a night out in New York City for those who can attend. And he brings together two intellectuals. They hash out a, uh, a resolution and the audience gets a chance to ask questions. Uh, they vote, and they publish it online through YouTube and uh, Reason Magazine, and really it's, it, it is a fantastic idea. One of the biggest debates in their kind of short history was between actually Peter Schiff and Eric Voorhees, the CEO of, of Shapeshift, where they talk and they debate the issue of Bitcoin. Um, it's fantastic. It really is very well done. Uh, Voorhees does a fantastic job, as does Schiff, in presenting sort of the skepticism with regard to uh, to Bitcoin. And that that's Gene's value. He is a very, very interesting thinker. Um, you'll hear his story, uh, little bits and pieces of it. Uh, I link to a lot of stuff in the show notes so you can get more information on him and SohoForum.org and all the things they're doing. They also have another debate coming up. Uh, on the crypto subject with uh, two really heavy hitters, Seyfi Dinamos of the Bitcoin Standard uh, book that's been passed around everywhere, and George Selgin, the longtime economist, uh, now a blogger, writer, author uh, through Cato. And Selgin's going to take the opposite, um, more skeptical view of, uh, of Bitcoin, where, of course, uh, Seyfi is, is, is going to take the, uh, the pro position. So... That's coming up in August, but in any case, let's get to know a little bit more about Gene, the Solo Forum, his views on crypto, a uh, fascinating guy, fun to talk to. I think you're really going to like the episode. So without any further ado, here's Gene Epstein of the Solo Forum. Hey, I have to say um, thank you. Uh, we met, and I, I'm, I'm sure you probably don't remember, but I went to I the... I do remember. I do remember. <laughs> I went to Freedom I, Fest. I, 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 I just reminded you that I remembered you. I you. know. I know. <laughs> Um, Sorry for calling you cute. I'm a dirty old man. Oh, it was it was so it was so fantastic because I was I was working for another yeah. um, crypto news outlet at the time, mm-hmm. and we were kind of combining my loves here. So we had mm-hmm. like a little wedding anniversary, taking her to Vegas, and then of course I could go to Freedom Fest and uh, uh, get some cool interviews. And so we were sitting; they they were setting up in this main hall in the mm-hmm. Paris uh, Resort, which is. Uh, uh, kind of a nice place and we were <laughs> we were sitting there and i said hey, honey that's gene epstein and she kind of looked oh. at me like because you know to, to me you guys are you know super celebrities uh yeah. to her it's just kind of her husband's weird um uh, fixation on these on these yeah. strange abstract concepts so we see you kind of you know by yourself and I said, he's alone you can get yeah. him now and so she walked over and in this space i and i'm sure you're you're aware having you know been in the media for a while um, there are some people with varying degrees of, you know, kind of intellectual fame and, uh, you, you know, you get a lot of prima donnas, you get a lot of people who have heirs and people and you have to go through 50,000 channels to get a hold of them. You were so kind. You stopped everything you were doing. You came over, you sat down with us, you let us fiddle with our stupid equipment. You gave us an interview and uh, I have never, never forgotten that. So I, I really say uh, thank you so much for doing it. Well, that. thank you. I take you take that as a compliment. I, I really do find it terrible that people uh, who get a little bit of limelight put on airs. And uh, I do my, my best uh, to just be an ordinary guy who has a few insights to share, which is all I'll ever be. So go ahead, shoot with the questions. Well, I, you know, I, you know, you, that's false modesty. Um, I've been following you since the uh, since the Baron days, oh. uh, Baron's days rather, and uh, a pretty fantastic column. Um, you know what what I'm noticing is that uh, you you have a few years on me, but we have a, a very similar path. You started out as uh, as a socialist, and 
yeah. were quite uh, fond and, and still remain somewhat fond of Noam Chomsky. Is, is, is that right? Oh, I'm very fond of him. You know, I love the guy. And uh, even though he's, uh, he's, he'll never see the light about uh, capitalism and so <laughs> But uh, he's great. And hey, come on, don't accuse me of false modesty. I take offense about that. <laughs> I, I hate pretentious, false, mod false and modest people. There it is. Okay. There, it is. there it is. I have some insights to share. That, yes, you that's do. That's basically all, all it is. And uh, all Chomsky ever was as well. And I admire people with insights to share. Uh, yeah. But, but indeed, getting back to Noam Chomsky and others, uh, one of the things you do learn, I can mention a few other people, people whom you with whom you strongly disagree about many things. Uh, that could be just the plight of being a libertarian, that we straddle uh, so many different viewpoints. Um, but there are people with whom I strongly disagree uh, about many things, but who I still have a very high regard for and from whom I've learned a lot. I could list some others, aside from Noam Chomsky, who are in that category. Yeah, and it's, it's something that I've always loved about your thinking is that um, you're not prone to... Um, I don't know, kind of bomb throwing and and uh, kind of the typical, especially nowadays, sort of the, the ad hominem side of things. Um, you come from a very disputational side of of the intellectual, uh, almost like to me, it's 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 almost like a you're you're sort of a natural extension of enlightenment thinking. You kind of want to take the best ideas, get them out there, get them flowing. Um, and on that, so so you're obviously no longer a socialist and have not been for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I'm a socialist sympathizer, and as, as you know, perhaps know, when I debated <coughs> Basco Sankara, the socialist, I basically said, look, look, the, the ideals of socialism are achievable in the context of capitalism. Go knock yourself out. Go do it. I'd love to see you succeed with uh, running your know, worker-owned uh, and operated uh, sure. cooperative businesses pay everybody the same, uh, you know, show that, that the socialist experiment in human terms can work because by and large it's failed to work up to now, but, uh, but uh, go pursue the socialist ideals within the context of capitalism because then you won't be trampling on the rights of others. Just don't resort to government's iron fist to bring socialism about. So again, I'm still a socialist sympathizer in that sense. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, that reminds me of an anecdote. Uh, Walter Block is fond of uh, recalling when he met uh, Ayn Rand and and then her um, uh, her. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter who who he was. <laughs> Nathaniel <laughs> Brandon. I was going to yeah, get yeah. some of the yeah, yeah, yeah. parts. That was an interesting story. But go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah but uh, that's, that was uh, uh, foul of me here. But um, anyway, so she and and uh, and Brandon were. Um, yeah. We're essentially at some sort of gathering, and, and Walter went down there to uh, to Hector them uh, uh, and give them give them heck, and yeah. he wound up uh, staying and, and debating with them. And he announced <clears throat> to Nathaniel Brandon, um, then Rand's uh, right hand uh, hand man, and said, I "Look, I'm, I'm I'm a socialist," as if to kind of throw it in his face, and yeah. without missing a beat, um, as as you've kind of spoken to here, uh, uh, Brandon said, uh, "Are you you know?" for voluntary socialism or for, oh. you know, okay, uh, yeah. yeah, for pushing in, in that direction. So that's, that's super interesting. And you at some point find Murray Rothbard, right? Oh yeah. Well, yeah, my history, indeed. I, 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 I did have this sort of like movie you know, uh, finish event, so to speak, you know, like the first episode of the film about me, probably four or five interconnected films uh, where <laughs> it ends. Uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm demoralized about teaching mainstream economics. I'm a graduate student at the New School, and um, I'm an inveterate browser. And I'm browsing in the in the stacks and the library of the New School. And a couple of times, I come across the two volume work, uh, "Man, Economy, and State" by Murray Rothbard. I'd vaguely heard of him. It was only about the second or third time I picked it up that I started reading it, and that was my conversion experience. Reading those two volumes. Man, Economy, and State by Rothbard meant a great deal to me because at the time teaching mainstream economics, it was really enlightening to read all the digressions in that uh, tome in which he showed the limitations of mainstream economics. It's a, I think it's a very odd way in. Actually, it's, it is Walter uh, Block who said there are many ways in. Yeah. And my way in was reading those two volumes. Probably not the best way in for most people, but it, it was where I was at at the time, and at the time I was in my late 20s. 
Yeah, and, and that's where we, we intersect here in terms of uh, intellectual genealogy. Um, very, very similar stories uh, in, in that regard. Um, I found Rothbard, um, Mises was given to me early on, and um, like the dolt I was, I, I sort of passed on him. He just seemed oh. impenetrable. Oh. And so Rothbard is, is warmer. Oh. It, it could just be for translation's sake. But he was definitely a, a great writer, as oh, economists yeah. go, and uh -huh. so he was he was much more i don't know he built on concepts in a way that I could find uh, uh, easier to understand that's i 'm not really putting it the right way but I, but, but I think you get my drift that he's oh, he's, yeah. a, he's a little bit more um, um, you know more oh, accessible. oh sure accessible. Oh, well, no, yeah. no kind of, well certainly Roth, Rothbard was a Jewish guy from Brooklyn he really wrote he wrote in in uh, in, in, a, in a truly direct vernacular uh, style. Uh, like a like a New Yorker, a brilliant uh, writer and expositor, and of course, um, my God, Mises did not start writing in English until he was fifty eight years right. old. Right, in German all his life, and so uh, in, uh, Mises's uh, style in English was actually quite accomplished for somebody who came from that background. My God, you and I should try this uh, at, at this point in life to write in German. By oh the my same. God, no way. Oh, indeed. Uh, but, uh, but then I, of course, I did read uh, Rothbard, and then I came to Mises later, uh, because, uh, you know, being prepared by reading Rothbard, I was able to understand Mises as well. And so there's a lot of good stuff that I read in Mises. And that title of the book, Human Action, that alone is a brilliant title. And um, really, you yeah. know, I recommend that it be read. But of course, for the most part, I, 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 I am privileged to have uh, uh, contributed an introduction to a book called Economic Controversies, a huge collection of Rothbard's essays, in which I'm, uh, I begin by saying it was writing. It was nearly 40 years ago that Rothbard, Murray Rothbard changed my life. What, what, were, what do you recall were the first writings of Rothbard that you came across that, that started to uh, move you? Uh, it, well, right away, it was uh, what has government done to our money? Uh, oh. The... the uh, the anatomy of the state um, or anatomy of the state, um, yeah. you know, it, it, some of the popular oh, yes. books. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, they're just, he's so approachable. He's, it, he's, yeah. he's a, uh, a, a gateway drug into uh, <clears throat> what uh, Gene and I are discussing is loosely oh. called the Austrian school of economics. And Mises is kind of the Dean uh, now, I guess, of, 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 of that school of, of economic thought. And um, Rothbard's a, kind of a, a gateway drug there. Um, oh, there's, yeah. There are neo-Austrians, I guess, now who are, who are kind of taking Rothbard's mantle. But, um, yeah, uh -huh. he, was, he was something else. Boy, change, he's a life changer. He really is. Yeah. No, I would, of course, go beyond that and say he was more than just a – if you want to use the drug analogy, I'll go with that. <laughs> but Murray, Murray was definitely the, uh, the, 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 the glass of beer and, and the scotch as, sure. as well. As well as the full, uh, full course, uh, you know, uh, wine and uh, and and vodka, because uh, he was not just a great popularizer, but uh, but also wrote essays that were popular consumption, but also um, um, books like Man, Economy, and State, and uh, uh, essays on uh, economics that he wrote, as well as his history of economics. He, he was a history of economic thought. I mean, he was a true uh, polymath in economics. But there's some really great. Uh, it, you shouldn't just read Rothbard. I agree with you of there. Course. Certainly, uh, try Hayek, try Mises, uh, as well as uh, writers like Walter Block. Yeah, um, and and it's it, once you just look at the bibliography of Rothbard, uh, since I'm on him now, it's it, it is breathtaking when you consider there was no functionally before he 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 died. There was really no internet in the way that we understand it, and the 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 just the quality of the stuff, even his posthumous stuff that uh, yeah. uh, I guess on the progressive era now that's being put out is, is unreal. It's just, it's so great. Um, and it makes you think differently about the world. But anyway, that was a and long a way to, to go ahead and go, pleasure, go. And a pleasure to hear his lectures, but go ahead. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, and his lectures. I guess we could segue in a good way. And, and, and I have to wonder uh, what, whether uh, what Rothbard would have thought uh, about Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, and that's ultimately speculative. Tragically, he died at the age of, age of 66, but it achieved so much. You know, I have to reflect, you know, when Rothbard was my age, he was dead for eight years. Right. 
And he, he died in 94, right? 90, uh, I guess it was, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, 94, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so that, that was kind of a long way to go to get us to Austrian, kind of, I guess, neo-Austrians now, but the Austrian School of Economics, and you would have thought, or I would have thought, that this would have been the group just way out in front and embracing cryptocurrencies, uh-huh. and uh, that, has, that has not, I mean, it, it is, of course, the case in, in some circles, notable circles, but uh, there's, it's a bit of a controversy in, uh, especially, well, the first mind, uh, the first uh, person that comes to mind would be Peter Schiff. And, uh, oh. and, and his, uh, he, he, he is not a fan of, of cryptocurrency. Well, I could, yeah, I, and I, I couldn't, I cannot regard Peter as somebody who belongs in the intellectual firmament in any sense at all, <laughs> much as I might respect his achievements as a, as a, as a money manager uh, or whatever else he's done. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, I, I'm a little surprised at what you say. I know certainly that uh, Bob Murphy, Robert Murphy, who sure. me, is a big supporter of Bitcoin and crypto, and written some good things about it, and which I, which have helped instruct me. And I'm not sure about Joe Salerno, who's the other bright light and Rothbardian. Mm-hmm. At the I think, as a matter of fact, Murphy did an interview with with Joe Salerno, and I have to listen to it. I, I believe that that Joe Salerno is is very uh, Bitcoin friendly. I'd be surprised if he wasn't. Um, certainly, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I do have a, when you talk about the Neo-Austrians, I certainly would not call Murphy and Salerno Neo-Austrians. They're very much in this sort of Rothbardian, Misesian, uh, okay. uh, Austrian tradition. On the other hand, I would apply, uh, I would, uh, I would apply the, the, the term, uh, for example, to George Selton, uh, uh, whom I have a high regard for, who is, uh, and Larry White, uh, Lawrence White, uh, who've written uh, very good things about money, and taught me a lot as well. But they and they aren't. Uh, they 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 are skeptical of cryptocurrency, and I don't oh. share that skepticism. So you're right in that sense. There's been a divide uh, among uh, free market people in money. Uh, I mean, the people I've just mentioned, they do all share the belief that the Federal Reserve is a problem and not a solution. They are anti-Fed and 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 they do not want government to run the money supply. So they all have that in common, but, but you're quite right that there is a divide about cryptocurrency among these people. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I found that fascinating and yeah. it was to the point where, um, you know, relatively early on in the space, uh, mm-hmm. Jeffrey Tucker, with whom I know you're extremely yeah. familiar, um, mm-hmm. got a lot of flack for even questioning Mises's uh, regression theorem and, and oh. uh, sort of his own, this is again, quite a few years ago. Yeah his own uh, his own embrace of uh, bitcoin at the time and and almost blamed his formal economics training uh for not giving him you know a better foothold to understand something like crypto so it's there's 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 been a, a real kind of tension there and i i think the debate you had with schiff and uh and eric Voorhees uh, last year um was at the soho forum was just unbelievable that's good well you know, it's interesting you raise that point. I, I guess you're right to say that uh, I it took me a little bit of an intellectual struggle um, quite a while back to appreciate the idea that that Bitcoin really is uh, very potentially the wave of the future in money that to support Bitcoin the way I do. Uh, and I guess you could say that partly because. Uh, I do. I did believe in the regression theorem of Mises, and still do. That maybe that's why it took me a bit of a while. I should explain uh, to listeners. Maybe you have a very learned group here that that the regression theorem uh, simply states that all money, the origins of all money, regresses back to a commodity, and uh, it regresses back in time to a commodity. Because, uh, as, and I think it's a brilliant historical inference, uh, in an inference about the logic of money. Um, it starts by saying that, uh, that you and I will accept money, I'll accept dollars uh, for a service, uh, because I, I know that yesterday those dollars could buy something. I have a prior knowledge that the money is valuable. Uh, I'm, I haven't done research. I know from experience. I've seen it buy things. So I, I know that yesterday it could buy things. So I'll accept it today, accept it as money today. But but yesterday, why was I willing to accept it as money? Well, because 
It could buy things the day before and then the day before that. Why did I accept it the day before that, the day before that? Because my parents told me it could buy things and the day before that, they knew that, that it could buy things. So we keep regressing back in time because that's the way human beings work. They have experience and they know that, that it was exchangeable for things the day before and the day before that. And so well, then Mises says, well, what happened? There had to have been a day zero. Well, how, how far back do we regress uh, in time? There's a day zero. And on that day zero, uh, money was a commodity. Going forward then in time, somebody, somebody realized that it was cumbersome to trade eggs for cattle. Uh, and so they, they, they figured that they would use some kind of commodity that, that's, that's generally accepted as a medium of exchange, to, that instead of buying the cattle with eggs, you buy the cattle, say, with seashells or with gold, with a commodity that has some value. Uh, and yeah, that's all that that's generally accepted for other purposes. And so that's what developed over time in impersonal relations in a division of labor economy, that a commodity was chosen and uh, by uh, by an innovative people with an imagination and that eventually over time, this commodity, gold being the preferable commodity in, in, in industrial nations, became the medium of exchange and that's how money began. So we regress back to the commodity, back to money and back to things like seashells or other kinds of commodities, but gold had properties that made it the most valuable commodity. Now that regression to him I think is still valid. Uh -huh. but now no, but no longer troubles me to think, and actually, you know, Bob Murphy likes to put it a different way, but, but the, the way I would put it is to say that Satoshi Nakamoto came along and I did find that from what I've read about him, of course, we don't know who he really was, but this was a person who invented Bitcoin and who clearly showed some knowledge of Mises and the regression theorem. And mm -hmm. he was hoping that, uh, that, that Bitcoin could be accepted as a medium of exchange because then given all our knowledge of money, he could make the point that it had, it was a, would be a fixed supply and could have stable value and that, and that it could then uh, become an, a medium of exchange. So in a way, I would argue not, I would argue that, that Bitcoin broke the rule about money originally becoming a commodity by building itself on the dollar. But it broke that rule by building on the knowledge that people had about how this could be a medium of exchange. And then the, the big historical event, I forget who it was, who decided, uh, who, who offered to sell pizza for Bitcoin. And <laughs> it was the first transaction, the first I, I, I don't know if this is really true that that was the first transaction in Bitcoin, but it was the purchase of, of a couple of pizza pies for Bitcoin, and that started things going. Yeah. So I don't have any trouble with that at all, and, and, but it still means that the regression theorem in terms of history is valid, but it also means that, that over time when people develop knowledge of money and its properties and what it can do, then we can imagine that cryptocurrency Bitcoin in particular, because that's the example I'm using, could become money. Because again, it, it, the, the, the real thing that, that Satoshi solved was to make sure that cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular, was, had a finite supply. Uh, and that, that was the property of gold as well. Gold doesn't have a finite supply, strictly speaking, but it is expensive to mine. And so it's got a limited supply and limitations on the supply are very important if we're going to use money. Because, of course, if the supply is unlimited, then the money has no value. And that was a that was a really wonderful way to to put that all into context. But that that is the tension, okay. and uh, you know whether it's solved or not, uh, it it does seem to be almost beside the point now because um, I think more even the more reticent are starting to accept uh, kind of in our intellectual circles that crypto is here to stay. Whether that means wow. you know this gigantic medium of exchange and overtakes fiat, and we have uh, an anarchist utopia or it just means that it becomes something else in ways that we can't possibly fathom um, <clears throat> is, is kind of where I think most people are looking now. But that debate, and, and this allows me to get into 
um, our mutual friend here, and I don't want to say you discovered her, but uh, you certainly uh, brought up her, her profile a bit in Naomi Brockwell, and you guys starting oh. the Soho Forum, right? Oh, so yeah. the, the yeah. Schiff Voorhees debate uh, was one in a long line, and um, it's just it's a fantastic uh, idea. Can, can you go into a little bit of how, how the Soho Forum started? Well, sure, thank you. And I, I do want to say, by the way, uh, before I get into that, that, that certainly um, there are people like Peter Schiff and our own funder, uh, Don Smith, who's a, Don Smith is a, um, is a uh, hedge fund manager, brilliant guy, mm -hmm. and a sweet man, and a real, uh, a, a truly principled libertarian. But he and Peter Schiff just cannot get their minds around the idea of cryptocurrency. They just right. hung up on gold. And so I, I don't know whether they'll come around eventually, but Don, for example, has shorted a Bitcoin. And of course, he's done quite well over the last <laughs> years doing that. And, uh, and at our debate uh, that I had with Peter Schiff versus Eric Voorhees, Don spoke for a couple of minutes be before being shouted down <laughs> very medical about how he's bearish on Bitcoin. And so, you know, they, they, uh, we haven't really uh, won the debate with those guys and they could potentially be our allies and uh, there's just no way seemingly they're just blocked they they're they're they just think that gold is the is the only way and and while and and the viewpoint of i think of people like you and me i believe is that gold and actually i i it's Stephanie, Stephanie and Amos who's made this argument he's the one who's going to be debating george selgin right uh, on this on the subject that uh, Gold did uh, obviously had a lot going for it. Still does have a lot going for it as the private sector's medium of exchange. But it's got a few problems, and one of them, of course, is that it's 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 fairly easy for government to seize it. Government did seize it. Uh, that's a problem, and uh, and also it does have uh, a uh, it it it, do, it does not have a, a finite supply. It could become. I mean, it's very possible, by the way, that could, there could be discoveries that would make gold, gold the gold supply very expandable. Uh, the uh, the invention of cryptocurrency is a landmark event in the history of free market money, and uh, and and it goes beyond the properties of gold. As good as gold is as money, um, cryptocurrency is better. And uh, it seems to be difficult for a number of people I know to put their mind around that. Yeah. Point. And, yeah. and just, just on your, your debate uh, with uh, uh, the, the debate you hosted with uh, Schiff and Voorhees, um, yeah. what was really, because Peter would later go on to, to sh say that his company was developing like a, a gold backed Bitcoin card or something. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of his way in. But what was really a, a revelation to me, uh, again, I'm going to, link to it in the show notes because that debate is amazing mm -hmm. but what was the revelation that came out of it was actually the dinner afterwards when Voorhees and crew kind of you know took Peter to to dinner and sat down with him and chopped it up right. and talked and whatever else and then it was revealed through just casual conversation that as much as Peter knows about it or you know can can debate the subject he'd never had a Bitcoin wallet and he'd never oh, sent and received oh. Bitcoin so there was there's a beautiful picture of Eric at wherever they were in, in New York City after this whole yeah. forum debate, you know, holding up Peter's phone and sending him Bitcoin. <laughs> and I thought, well, there it is. You know, I mean, that that is that will be the difference. I think it, it's you know maybe the difference, maybe poor analogy, but riding a bike versus reading about riding a bike. Oh wow! You, you know, I didn't know this story. Is that right? This, you're telling me something for the first time about. Wow. Uh, about all the, I love, I love that. I did not. Know. I'll send, I'll send you the picture. It's, it's a classic. We have a, we have a party getting to my soul forum. We know we, uh, my wife caters it. People arrive. There's food available right away. There's a cash bar. Uh, there's of course free water um, and uh, there's <laughs> wine, a wine bar. And uh, so we have a party both before and after uh, the soul forum. Uh, I, uh, I had been hosting uh, uh, monthly events that were run by uh, uh, legendary uh, fund manager, Victor Niederhofer. He called it Junto. I, uh, I'd moved, uh, my, my office had been moved to Midtown because uh, Rupert Murdoch bought Dow Jones and moved us to Midtown. Uh, he mainly wanted to buy the Wall Street Journal, but Barron's that I wrote for came along with the package. So suddenly I'm working in Midtown for the first time and uh, Junto, uh, this uh, monthly event that Victor Niederhofer 
ran, was just around the corner. So I went, and then Victor asked me if I would uh, run the events. So I started to do that and bring in debates. And uh, then when Victor uh, Niederhofer shut down his junto, uh, it was actually Naomi and my stepson, uh, JJ, who encouraged me to, uh, to bring one-on-one uh, -on -one debates alive. I have felt that uh, debate groups like uh, Intelligence Squared, which happens in New York, are flawed, and that many of these debate models are flawed because they do two against two. And um, I think two against two is usually cumbersome. You can't, they, they, not, nobody gets enough time to really talk. The real problem is that it's very difficult to get the pairs to coordinate. And so uh, I decided it's gotta be a one against one uh, um, debate uh, approach uh, and framework. And then on top of that, I would use Oxford style voting where you vote before, after, or undecided on the resolution before the debate begins. And then you vote uh, the same, vote again after the debate ends and whoever moves the vote in his or her favor uh, technically wins the Tootsie Roll, wins the debate. And um, so uh, <laughs> when this was launched in, uh, in the fall of, of, uh, of 2016 with the generous help of Don Smith who decided to take a chance on me. Don had been a friend, the guy I just mentioned before who's very skeptical about Bitcoin, uh, gave me enough money to do it for a few months and we were getting huge crowds and then in fact crowds were so large that we started to charge uh, for tickets and we now charge uh, in general admission $24 in a hall of about 200 people, uh, $12 for students. And I think it's partly, it, it's been great success and I've been very pleased. We, we sell out almost every event uh, in our hall and uh, Reason uh, uh, Video, uh, uh, Reason TV then joined forces with us. Uh, a pleasure working with my own son, Jim Epstein, who's, who helps run Reason TV. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they record it. We were recording all our events prior to, to being taken on by Reason, but now Reason records it uh, on video and audio and distributes it. And um, my socials and debate got 40,000 hits. We had a few others that got as many as 40,000 views on YouTube. Uh, our Bitcoin debate has got nearly a half a million views. Wow. Uh, and so, and, uh, and so we get at least an average of about, at least about 10,000 views for our videos. And, and, audio, and audios, so it gets a lot of attention. It's, it's debates and topics that are of interest to libertarians. We have, I, I, I always do schedule way in advance. Uh, there's a frustration there because I'd like to be somewhat, a little bit more on, on the news and on topics that are in the news with respect to the debates, but it is very difficult to get, uh, you know, two qualified people, uh, to debate each other, to be in the same place at the same time, and to be willing uh, to go through it. There's no question. I've done three debates at my own solo forum, um, and I can tell you that it's a lot of pressure. You know, certainly you're there, you're the only one defending your resolution uh, against another uh, party, uh, there's a voting. So uh, there, there are some people who, who, for whom, whose temperament is not suited for debates. Uh, but uh, I, there are a lot of people who are, and I've been, as I say, very pleased with the result. Tomorrow night, it's too late, we're all sold out. I don't know when you're going to air this, but this, so probably tomorrow night was already a few days ago when you air this, but uh, we've got, we, we're having a debate on the origins of the financial crisis. The next one, middle of March, uh, I believe that's, I haven't checked the date, I think it's March 15th, but go on www.thesoulform.org thesoulform.org to check the dates. You can buy tickets. The next one is going to be about uh, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Oh, wow. Uh, so you're just going to so, take it easy, huh? Yeah, take it easy. Uh, on a light, light subject. <laughs> yeah. And then April is going to be on climate change. Uh, and so those wow. are the two that we're, that we're, that we're going to do. Uh, I moderate uh, the debates, and I try to be fair-minded uh, to both sides. And moderating it. I have found that I can often lure a progressive to come if that progressive has written a book. Uh, you know, people, as you, sure. you don't know, if you haven't written a book, you probably don't know that uh, any book writer is a supplicant. You'll, you'll do uh, book signing in the men's bathroom of <laughs> if they'll only give you the, the gig. And so I can often attract people who've written books to defend those books and to defend those books against uh, 
against a, a, a libertarian, although I have gotten a lot of gutless turndowns, I have to say. A lot of a lot of people who will not defend their books because they're a little afraid of being criticized in public for their ideas. Uh, but that's, of course, what the debate is all about, the clash of ideas. Uh, and I think we sell it. I think it sells, uh, uh, and people want to come, not just because the topics are of interest, but because it is a theatrical evening. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one conflict is inherently theatrical, and the, the before and after voting uh, also lends a kind of a conclusion to the evening that, that, that makes it satisfying. So I think that's another reason why uh, while there were those who doubted very much that we could sell tickets to this event, get people to pay $24 a ticket, uh, we've proved them wrong because it is, again, uh, a compelling evening of drama and theater and intellectual uh, exchange. And they, they hold up over time, and, and that's yeah. what it's, – it's, uh, it really is a, a fantastic idea. And if, uh, if my listeners aren't, uh, aren't exactly familiar with the SohoForum.org, uh, get out there. They're also uh, on YouTube quite a bit through uh, Reason uh, TV and, and now especially. <clears throat> but what uh, the format is, as as Gene described, is they, they take kind of a, an, an electronic poll beforehand about the resolution in affirmative, negative, and so on. And then they poll afterwards um, mm -hmm. and see, you know, who moved the crowd the most uh, mm -hmm. towards towards the their, their particular part of the resolution. And uh, it's it really is an interesting way to uh, to incentivize the uh, it could, and 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 also what I love too is that uh, Gene will go on his Twitter account uh, he's he's surprisingly active and he will oh. call out people so if he doesn't get an email or something from someone he's trying to get to debate he will actually at them on Twitter and of course everybody dutifully retweets it and so the person is <laughs> is well, kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because well, yes, now he can't say he didn't get yeah. the email. <laughs> I tr I've been trying to get Ben Shapiro to do right. it. Right. I won't go into this. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, Scott accused me of, uh, of maybe uh, you know, uh, you know, putting the kibosh on it <laughs> by, by, by uh, a Twitter, tweeting uh, Ben Shapiro about six different times. And and uh, so uh, who knows if that really works. Yeah, getting to your point about it, it, the other part of it is that, uh, of, of the way we run the evening, is that certain, first... Uh, bear in mind that the Oxford style before and after voting certainly did not originate with us. It, it's uh, sure. it originated with, with debating and, and you know, uh, legendarily at Oxford, the before and after vote. And it does establish a baseline. And that's the important point to understand that, that usually because this is a libertarian audience and anybody arguing this side of the issue, it's not always a libertarian versus progressive. Right. But, debate. but when it is, then whoever's uh, arguing the libertarian side, generally speaking, comes in with about 50% of the vote already. And so that counts against him. You know, yep, it, 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 that's the point. It's a level playing field. That's why I like it so much. Yeah, I, I like how you do it. And so that, and uh, because again, you can only earn points for, for the votes you change, uh, not the votes that are already in your right. favor walked in. Uh, I, I, I do point with pride to the fact that I've won all three of my debates. <laughs> but that's because I really work hard at it. And I do, yeah, you do. I do. When I debate, I, I work hard at hard to prepare. You know, they, I mean, one of the key things that you have to do is not just know your subject, but make sure you're fully knowledgeable about about whatever the other side has written or said about the topic, so you can zero in on what that side says. It is a, it is an eighty minute format, which takes a little bit of chance on people's uh, attention spans. Right. We do have we do allocate thirty minutes for Q and A, uh, and uh, but then another uh, great move. Yeah, there's a fair amount of, of speaking uh, so because I do want to avoid sound bites. At Intelligence Squared, for example, uh, where they have two against two, each each person gets only six minutes to talk. I mean, it's yeah. way too way too brief. Uh, the initial uh, the initial statements, pro and con, run between twelve and fifteen minutes, depending on what what I want, how much I want to allocate. But at least twelve minutes allocated. Tomorrow night uh, on uh, on uh, this issue of the causes of the national crisis, each side is going to get an initial fifteen minutes to present his case because it does require some time. And so it does make some demands on the attention span of the audience, uh, but it, uh, it, it still does seem to work. And I've 
been very pleased with how it's been going. And that's why it's so great to have you on our show because, you know, immediately, you know, people say, well, what does this have to do with crypto necessarily? But when you realize that Bitcoin cryptocurrencies are, and what it really is, is sort of the king of interdisciplinary studies okay. in that the financial crisis, while, you know, tomorrow night you say, well, does that have to do with Bitcoin? I mean, theoretically, not theoretically, logically, that is the spur uh, in, in the Genesis block and elsewhere for the entire crypto idea. Uh, at least it gave it wings and people constantly refer back to uh, the financial oh, crisis as being the, 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 the catalyst for, you know, where we are now 10 years later in terms of, in, you know, just the myopia of crypto. Um, but uh, so the Soho Forum is, is <clears throat> it's mandatory listening, watching. If you're in New York, if you're in the area, it's mandatory attendance. You just have to go. It's, it's a fantastic uh, idea. And, I, 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 exactly, and I want to fit in the point that 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 we do have a dual mission. Uh, it's a social evening as well, and uh, I do want you know people get it. We, the, the the proceedings end around ten after eight, quarter after eight, and then most people, more than half the audience, sticks around uh, for more food and more wine to discuss what went on, to talk to the debaters. You know, plenty of things to do and plenty of ways to mix it up with people. Uh, at uh, at the Soho Forum, but getting to your point as well, uh, it is true. I, I hadn't thought of that. That it had not, had not readily occurred to me that indeed the the financial crisis did spur um, interest in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Sure. Unfortunately, it also spurred a, a certain amount of of dangerous uh, and 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 foolish ideas that capitalism was failing us right. once again. But that's going to be the debate. Uh, I do have strong opinions about all of these things, as you, as, as, as I guess your listeners can tell from the way I've been talking. But I do scrupulously uh, moderate the debates by being fair to both sides and being both giving both sides an ample opportunity to answer questions and to talk and to and to raise objections to the other side. That's my fundamental burden as the moderator uh, of the Soul Forum uh, and. So it's what I do. I, I should say that we are, I think, uh, maybe to wrap it up, I do think that if, if we think in terms of the future of, of, of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, I, I, I do think that there is a financial crisis that's likely to come, probably not in the next few years, but more likely maybe 15 to 20 years from now as the, uh, as the financial burdens of the federal government become more and more impossible to bear. I think that's when uh, it's very possible that the dollar will become increasingly unstable, and that's when uh, cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, will really take off in value. Uh, probably will not happen uh, for uh, in the next decade, but probably sometime 15 years from now, where I see the potential uh, for uh, the silver lining in the financial crisis of the state that, that for example, the, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office keeps warning about uh, a fiscal crisis is that uh, Bitcoin could then become the preferred medium of exchange. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> from your mouth to the, uh, to the economic God's ears here. Um, and so to wrap it up, I, prom I said I'd keep you to a half an hour and I've gone well over that. Um, I, 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 I'm the one who's dragged it out. <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. Um, Sorry to the audience for trying their patience. I, I <laughs> oh, we well, love it. And uh, so the the next one of, 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 you know, for sure interest to my listeners, to CoinSpice listeners, would be uh, the Almost Safety and um, George Selgin debate, which is going to happen uh, in August. Uh, August 12th. Yeah, and I do. And I do think for those of you who are out of town, and uh, it's a good excuse to come to New York. I'm sure there are a couple of things you could do uh, in uh, in New York in August. And uh, on top of that, if if you do want to be there, there's Q and A, there's participation, people to meet, and so it's a good place to go to. And I do recommend uh, tickets are on sale now. Uh, the uh, the previous Bitcoin debate we had was sold out. Uh, months before the event itself uh, and so we're anticipating that uh, happening again and so I do recommend uh, that you buy your tickets now uh, if you go on thesoulform.org for that event on August 12th. Hey,